had no idea what I should do with my life. I never felt like I wanted, I wanted or had to be in the center of things. It just kind of happened with the success of my career, my modeling, you know, I kind of ended up there by a flu. Marcus Schenkenberg's story reads like the American dream. He came from very obscure beginnings in suburban Stockholm, very far from the glitzy lights of international stardom. It was a wonderful place to grow up, very normal um, upbringing, and uh, I think I was a pretty good boy, you know, didn't get in too much trouble. I just wanted to play with my friends, be outside, did all kinds of sports. Basketball was my main thing, but we also played tennis, we played soccer, very much outside. Well, the way it should be, I think. Back in the late 70s and 80s, Sweden was a Scandinavian country not known for much beyond its mountains, blonde Vikings, Volvo, and minimalist furniture design. The concept of beautiful things that make your life better has always been highly regarded in Swedish design. The base palette is neutral, the structure simple and durable, the materials sustainable. Not too much, not too little, just right, or lagom in Swedish, is often used to describe the national ideal, and this is evident in all things from politics to music, architecture to art, and yes, in fashion too. Sweden was in a golden age of liberalism, prosperity and high living standards. Architects Yvonne and Robert Schenkenberg van Mierot were of mixed Dutch and Indonesian heritage, one Catholic, the other Protestant, the pair eloped from the Netherlands to seek a better life. Their boys, Michael and Marcus, would be born into a freer society. My grandparents were religious. Every time we went to Holland, we drove down. Every summer, every other summer, they prayed before dinner. It says, Salve forbidden, which means, shall we pray before dinner? We all close our eyes and me and my brother's like, oh, here we go again, you know. But we closed our eyes and pretended we were praying kind of thing, and we didn't know, you know. But my parents were, they stopped doing that. They didn't do it to, to us, and they didn't push religion or anything. His father is a cool guy, you know. He's pushing 80, and he's driving a Harley Davidson. So he's, he's a bit of a poser. I think he got that from his father. His mother, Yvonne, is, is a saint. She's absolutely wonderful, this serene, beautiful, beautiful person. I always looked up to my father. I thought he was so cool, you know. He's, he like he smoked a lot of cigarettes, which was cool. You saw it in the movies, you know, the cool guys smoking cigarettes. And, you know, he had this leather jacket. He always dressed in black. And and so I thought my, my father was super cool, you know, and kind of looked up to him. He comes from this really intellectual background, you know, with the architect, you know, where form and design and, and uh, conversations and... You know, I think that had benefited him when he works with people. For an energetic boy who craved excitement, and yes, maybe a little danger, the sleepy surroundings of Stockholm were a little on the dull side. No surprise then that his other big influence in life was blockbuster American movies. You're all clear, kid. Now let's go home. I got so influenced from movies. I saw Star Wars when I was 11 years old, and I was obsessed with Star Wars. Every time I saw a movie, I got so impressed with it. Little Sweden, it was so calm. I was kind of bored, little boring, nothing happening. While Meanwhile, I saw these Hollywood movies, and I figured, you know, someday I want to go there and see what it's like. Marcus dreamed of being able to fly becoming a famous NBA basketball player, or entering the armed forces. When I grew up, 
I saw the movie Top Gun with uh, Tom Cruise. You two characters are going to Top Gun. Yes, sir. So I wanted to become a fighter pilot, as many others, I think, after seeing that movie. But me being a Dutch citizen, I, I couldn't even do the army. I actually applied when I was 14. I wanted to become a Swedish citizen, but I was too young. I had a little bit of complex when I was a kid. I, I didn't like anything about myself. I didn't like my straight, dark hair. I wanted curly hair instead of straight. And I wanted, you know, I had a little bit of a darker skin complex. I wanted lighter. I was a little bit taller than everyone else. I hated that. I wanted to be like normal, average guy, you know, so. But I guess maybe it's a typical kid, you know, you, you want everything the opposite of, of what you had. So I didn't feel really comfortable in my skin. I was not the most popular. I was always kind of in the middle. So I went to this basketball school and my coach said, Marcus, you're way too skinny. You need to put some muscles on your body. So he got me into the gym and we started weightlifting. And as soon as I started weightlifting at probably 16, 17, and my body just reacted right away. I mean, I started growing muscles as soon as I started lifting weights. I had seen the film Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I was so impressed with him. I'm like, oh my God, that's a man, you know, like he's so muscular and masculine and strong, and I want to be like that. Into this environment rollerbladed a 19-year-old Swedish babysitter, part Dutch, part Indonesian, a total ingenue, with no idea he was about to turn the fashion industry upside down. When the boss told me I was going to interview a supermodel, I was hoping it might be her, or maybe her, or even a set of these. So you can imagine my disappointment to discover the model was a bloke, Marcus Schenkenberg, the world's first male supermodel. Marcus Schenkenberg's name is now legend. Anyone who was alive in the 90s will never forget that Calvin Klein jeans insert of 120 pages in Vanity Fair magazine. The ads that followed dominated the billboards, the magazine pages and the fantasy lives of anybody remotely attracted to the male form. His body was a revelation of Michelangelic proportions and fashion photography was to be the canvas. In successive campaigns, he would artistically bear all for the likes of Versace, Givenchy, Valentino and Almani, and be immortalized by top photographers such as Bruce Weber, Richard Avedon, Stephen Klein, Stephanie Frender Stylander, and Herb Ritz. Many wanted to be him, and women wanted to be with him. His body, forget about it. The phenomenon Marcus created shifted the zeitgeist towards a more level playing field, and the realization that certain supermen could command as much attention and dollars as their famous female counterparts. The world was looking at a brand new species, the male supermodel. Americana was popular the world over, and many young people had stars in their eyes about making it in the land of opportunity. Marcus studied economics in Stockholm, but by the age of 18, he and his best friend began to feel a stronger pull towards America. Whilst Anders had filmmaking ambitions behind the lens, Marcus was more interested in a career in front of it as an actor. I went to high school with Marcus Schenkenberg, 
And I knew Marcus before he became the icon, Marcus Schenkenberg, because we were in high school together. It was sort of clear from the beginning that he dreamt of another life outside of Sweden and go to seek fame and fortune. So literally, it sounds like a cliche or something, but he wanted to pursue his dreams and so did I. And I was going to go to film school in Hollywood and he was going to pursue acting. Marcus's brother Michael would go on to become a model Swedish citizen family man, and prime example of a good life well lived in the more traditional sense. It was not the path for Marcus. I remember when you were kids, he was not a big fan of the paint by numbers books you have with kids, like 14 is yellow, seven is red. And I think Marcus is the kind of guy that he wants to make his own painting, right? He doesn't do paint by numbers. He lives his life fully, I would say. Marcus has always been interested in the concept of happiness and maybe to the extent that he's a little bit selfish because he really wants to spend time the way he wants to spend it, uh, live in places where he wants to live and spend time with people he wants to spend time with and eat the kind of food that he likes and drive the cars he likes and he really has created this everyday paradise that's his, his life and he has um, he has this freedom that he really enjoys. I felt like I got to figure out what to do with my life. I had no idea. I didn't want to work in a bank like my parents wanted me to do or be a doctor. And so I felt like, OK, I got to travel, the life experience, learn English. So me and one of my best friends, Anders, we decided, all right, as soon as we finish school, let's go to the United States. The first fashion show I did when I worked at the amusement party, made a fashion show at Grana Lund where we had to staff, some of the guys did, and I had no idea what I'm doing. I was so nervous, and even there was a small amount of people watching. And as I did work, I learned, you know, on set. After a few times, I started relaxing more, and, and then I just kind of learned to pose and do my thing as I went along. In Sweden, when I got into this uh, agency, Stockholmsgruppen, I did two or three jobs. Like, did one job for some office, but they cut off my head. But I was happy, and that was actually my first, first, first job. And I figured, gosh, my, my face must be really ugly since they cut it off. It was so much competition. Like, you know, I just figured, gosh, no, I don't think I'm gonna make it. But uh, as soon as I got to New York and I showed my pictures to a couple of modeling agencies and they rejected me, I thought, mm, well, maybe this is not the path for me. It seems too hard and too much competition. And so I kind of gave it up. I remember in high school, he really wanted to do something outside of the box. He wanted to get rocked out of his orbit and just going to Hollywood without a backup plan to pursue a better life. And you know what? He got a better life. He gambled and he won. We bought this ticket with five cities, uh, New York to Orlando, to Washington, to New Orleans, to Los Angeles, back to New York for $200, unbelievable price. We took off, I said to my parents, listen, I gotta figure out what to do with my life and I'll be gone for like a year. We're gonna go to the United States and see what happens. And my parents, of course, got a little worried, wondering how that's gonna go. And we had $200 each in our pocket. We figured we, we're gonna have to figure out some way to make a living and, but we'll wing it first came to New York and it was just unbelievable. We're like, oh my gosh, we've seen all these Empire State building in the movie and we were actually here and I was unbelievable. And we stayed some cheap hotel and ate whatever we could afford. We drove cross country like Thelma and Louise. We just drove for days and days and days and we met a lot of strange people and it was fantastic. And Marcus was, he was a bit skinny back then. He didn't look like a supermodel, you know. He was a, a studious kid, you know, was into basketball, very nice, you know, tall, skinny. And then we landed in Hollywood. 
we were going back to New York and we rented a car, a mint blue Ford Mustang convertible. And we were driving over Malibu and uh, it was really warm and it was February. It was shitty weather in New York. It was ice cold and, you know, it was a snowstorm when we left. With the cool wind in our hair, with the sunshades in that car, we said, we're going to stay. We're going to stay in LA and we're going to live the Hollywood life. We lived in central Hollywood. I got an apartment and he stayed at a motel across the street. So we were uh, actually neighbors. He wanted to become a film director. When we came, we traveled around for a few weeks and ended up in Los Angeles. And he, I got a, this job taking care of seven dogs and he got a job at a shoe store called Hurricane Shoes on Hollywood Boulevard. And then later on, he started going to a film school at UCLA to um, study directing. Now he's actually a uh, successful director and he's done a lot of films and TV series here in Sweden. So he kind of fulfilled his dreams as well. I always thought that he was going to go into acting. He was really a movie buff. So I was sort of surprised by the model bit because they've always been very interested in acting and he's a very good actor. He didn't look like a supermodel back then, but during that summer, that first summer in Los Angeles, he started getting very, very serious about his fitness routine, his workout routine, I mean, really serious. So like in one summer, he, in one year, he gained like 10 kilos in muscle and he started hanging out at Venice Beach. And he sort of blossomed into what would later become Marcus Schenkenberg. And I started seeing reactions. People on the streets were looking at him, you know, pointing fingers in a good way. He sort of transformed over that summer, 1988, into um, his image, what, what, what became his image. Anders Lenberg directed an art feature for film school with Marcus playing the lead. Meatballs and Macaroni was the pair's first ever feature film credit and an early example of what could be termed the Schenkenberg effect. The film had audiences asking with awe, who is that guy? The cusp of the 90s was the birth of LA as a culture engine. Los Angeles was a wannabe's dream, a modern wild west where dreams were manufactured courtesy of Hollywood. A number of movies depicted LA as a destination with unique identity. West Coast hip hop would emerge as a major force in music during this period. Moreover, the gang activities in films were actually taking place in the streets. American fashion was also being influenced by LA street culture. LA streetwear became an overnight sensation and the trend did not let up through the early 90s. Californian fashion was generally leaning towards the simpler design after the flashy excess of the 80s. This was also the decade of the gap. The San Francisco-based denim retailer took a sophisticated turn with its Individuals of Style ad campaign featuring icons such as Sharon Stone, Lenny Kravitz and Anthony Kiedis. And it was all American denim that would become inextricably linked with Marcus Schenkenberg's career. People always talk about the 70s as being a golden decade for American movies. The 90s were kind of the same thing for American fashion, and Calvin Klein was one very good reason why. He was changing the way people felt about the most basic things, like jeans and underwear. Shouts goes out to my man Calvin Klein, good looking out for the drawers. It's a challenge because, because we're not just, I'm not just looking for editorials in a magazine, I'm looking to dress real people. And it's the 90s, that's what fashion's about today. I was actually on Venice Beach 
I saw this beautiful girl roller skating, dancing, and like I started talking to her, and she said, "No, just you know, you should just buy a pair of secondhand skates and start roller skating with it." So I ran to the secondhand skate store and bought a pair of skates for fifteen dollars and started、uh, roller skating because of this girl that I. Thought was so amazing. Isa Isa Cordova Soto was her name. So I went there every weekend, and Isa was showing me moves, and we、uh, started doing this routine together. And that was my weekend. I really look forward to it every week, especially to see this girl Isa that、uh, I had a crush on. That's where I got discovered on Bend the Speech. Barry King,、um, he started actually taking pictures of me、uh, roller skating. I mean, we always had a big crowd watching us, so I didn't even notice. Then he came up to me and said, "Hey, I think you got a good look, and、uh, do you want to do some test photos?" And he seemed like a nice guy, so we did, and we did some test photos. And he said, "You know, you should take him to an agency and see if you know maybe they'll take you on." So I went to LA Models, and they thought the pictures were good. They took me on, and that's where I eventually met the talent scouts from Italy. They took me to Italy, and that's how I basically started my modeling career, and then、uh, opened a whole new chapter in my life. I always thought that he was going to be an actor because he was always taking acting classes and going to auditions and everything. But he didn't become an actor. He became this icon instead. My first job in Los Angeles was these posters. This guy, a great photographer named Cal Yi, said, "Hey, do you want to do a poster?" And、uh, I said, "Yeah, sure." He would pay me three hundred dollars or five hundred dollars, which was amazing for me back then. Ended up shooting two posters, one by myself in a tiny speedo up against a brick wall or something, and then with four other guys in the locker room. Me being the football player with you know football gear and and, and bare chest, and when I joined LA Models, they sent me to a casting for a car commercial or car advertisement, and the job would pay like ten thousand dollars. I like I could not believe it. Like my gosh, it's like being in the lottery every day. Like so, I I said this is amazing. If I could just score one. Job every once in a while, I could totally live on this, you know. Whilst it may seem as though his trajectory was meteoric, as with all new models, he had to go through the process of building a portfolio, going to castings, learning on the job, and patiently keeping the faith. Ended up in Milan, where I had no money at all again, and I remember not being able to buy food even. So I asked the agency that had flown me over, "Can I get a little bit of money to,、uh, you know, buy some food? I'm kind of starving." And and they said, "No, my Marcus, it's not possible. You have to work. We can't give you any money." I'm like, "Damn, I'm like so hungry." <laughs> so. I called my mom and said, "Hey, mom, I'm starving." And you know, she almost started crying on the phone. She said, "Of course, can't be starving." It was a very difficult time. But then I、uh, met this talent scout from Greece. They said, "Come to Greece. There's, there's less competition. You could probably start working there and make some money." There, I started working every week and did some kind of job and made some money. And、uh, got some experience、uh, posing in front of cameras. His portfolio from Mykonos in Greece attracted the attention of an agent from Elite Paris. It had been almost two years since Marcus left Sweden. Now, aged twenty and gaining momentum, he returned to visit his family, and then moved to fashion's mecca, Paris. I remember one of my first shoots in Paris. I mean, I had so little money before I got my big break, and they asked me to, you know, strip down to my underwear. I knew I had holes in my underwear. I didn't know I, what am I gonna do. Gosh, they want me to strip down to my underwear, and you know, I had kind of no choice, and I just tried to cover my holes in my underwear. 
but I think they saw them and they were, the photographer was kind of laughing and, you know, I, I was embarrassed, but they thought it was kind of funny. And when I told my parents that, you know, I got an offer to start modeling when I was in LA and they were very skeptical. And once I started making money, I bought my mom really nice birthday presents with diamond bracelets and stuff. She said, oh, maybe this modeling thing is not too bad anyways, you know, maybe you should go for it, you know. I ended up on a couple of covers of magazines and got her some nice presents. So then she saw it a little, little bit more optimistic about this uh, modeling thing. I'm too sexy for my love, too sexy for my love, love's going to leave me. Today's pages of style bibles like Vogue Homme, Another Man, Esquire, GQ, Details and Fantastic Man are filled with striking faces, but campaigns are still the standard by which all are judged. Finding the perfect balance between edgy editorials and coveted contracts is what makes stars. But holding the interest of major brands over a length of time solidifies careers. Within a year of his discovery on Venice Beach, Marcus Schenkenberg had gone from being a nanny to becoming the muse of Calvin Klein. During the 80s and 90s, Calvin Klein, along with fellow Bronx-born designer Ralph Lauren, rose up to become global powerhouse brands. Klein's booming empire at the same time included a full ready-to-wear women's wear line, fragrances for both sexes, a menswear was the next frontier. He presented a whole generation of men with the masculine essentials, suiting, jeans, t-shirts and underwear. Tommy Klein, it was like the top dog, the main event, like Brooke Shields, when she was 15 years old, she got a big break with Tommy Klein too. You want to know what comes between me and my Calvins? Nothing. Whoever worked for Calvin Klein became a big star, basically, almost. Same thing with Guess, you know, like Claudia Schiffer and all these girls. Like, you worked for Guess, you became a big star. It was the same thing with Calvin Klein. Just to work for Calvin, that was like, wow, this could be something, you know? It's been uh, kind of the trademark of my career. I had done a photo shoot in, in Miami for a catalog. And while I was in Miami, I met this uh, agent from an uh, agency in, in Miami who said, hey, can I represent you? I said, fine. And he called me up a couple of months later and said, hey, Bruce Weber and Calvin Klein are interested in you for uh, a new campaign. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, of course. And they actually booked me directly from Paris, flew me into San Francisco, where we shot for about a week, 10 days. I had no idea that uh, I was going to be the main guy in that campaign because there were so many models all over the place, like 30, 40 models. And Bruce Weber just ran around and shot pictures. Everyone's hanging out and, and Bruce Weber shot pictures of people hanging out. And, and then when that came out, they made a 116 page advertisement in Vanity Fair. And it was me and Carrie Otis were like the main stars, the main people of this campaign. It was amazing. Already an editorial sensation, thanks to several late guest jeans ad campaigns in the 80s, Carey Otis was a rising star in the fashion world, who represented the new breed of superwomen in her own rebellious way. Her inclusion in the 91 Calvin Klein jeans campaign as the single strong female counterpart to a sea of men was a perfect pairing. There was a different invitation in the 90s to be defiant, to be emotional, to be dramatic, to be fierce, to be on a Harley Davidson motorcycle, to be a rock star. And really, those of us that could scream and do all these crazy things were the ones that became sort of the supermodels of that era. Just like 
so badass. For the Calvin Klein shoot in San Francisco, that whole rock star epic era one. So I know Marcus Schechenberg was like right there with me. And we were given an opportunity to sort of be these rock stars, <laughs> which was a really fun role. I mean, I can't play guitar. I can scream, but I definitely can't play guitar. I don't think he can play guitar, but we could fake playing guitar really, really well. There weren't any guidelines other than this is the situation. This is who you are. This is where you are. And an invitation to find our own personal stories within it. And we didn't have to share what those personal stories were. And I know for me, I already had many personal stories to channel into if I had become a rock star, not a model. And Bruce being like, I will follow you through this journey. And that's exactly sort of what unfolded. Becoming the rock stars for the evening and, you know, screaming and playing guitar and feeling exhausted and collapsing on a floor with like every, every other person that was on the shoot and getting up and having a cigarette and having coffee and, you know, taking a nap and whatever it was. It was the perfect condition for the dawning of a new era, a rock star designer, star power, and a legendary photographer who knew exactly how to capture the zeitgeist. Calvin Klein on cert, as it's called, that was Holly Bag with Vanity Fair, was really kind of a big style earthquake. You know, it was the first time we got to see a full campaign realized. It was so lavish and it was, you know, pages were just devoted to Marcus and a girl in a shower or someone, you know, barely wearing anything and then someone dressed up in a, in a cool sporty look and it was just all black and white. Carrie Otis looking gorgeous, Marcus Schenkenberg, a couple other models and it really kind of changed things. In a way, he was creating the new hunks and the new heroes and the new, you know, the kind of the new guard. I always have to give a lot of creative kudos to Calvin Klein, the man, because he always was the one who wanted to push the envelope a little bit. Whenever Calvin Klein came out with something and he would pick the best photographers, you knew it was gonna be sensational. So that was, that was a big moment. And I bet if you go back and look at it, it still looks great and it, and it looks timeless. Bruce Weber was really one of the five top photographers at the time. I mean, I guess he still is. So Bruce was a visionary. He wanted to be an observer of what it was that we created and because we had worked with Bruce before, I, I believe all of us had, there was a mutual trust, both in that the images that he was gonna capture were going to be incredible, epic, historic, and beautiful, and meaningful, and tell a story. And that was the other interest at that time was really to tell a story, for us to create a story for a photographer to tell, and then for the photographer to find the story and follow us through the story. I'm from San Francisco, so being on the streets of San Francisco was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I am feeling this. Like, these are my roots. So it was an incredible opportunity. It was incredible play. The pictures obviously are so epic and stand the stamp of time to this day. And we had a ball, you know, we, we had a ball. And I definitely will not say every photo shoot was like epic and amazing and memorable, but that one was, that one definitely was. And you have a feeling too, when, when you're making magic, you're like, something's happening here and it's really special. And you go with that magic. And some people can move into that magic and create from it. Some people are like, ah, this is like too unknown. I need something more fixed. And that whole group for that photo shoot was like all in. And it was, it was really great. Like Klein, Bruce Weber was a star maker in his own right. The all-American photographer shoots exclusively on film to this day and is best known for his mostly black and white editorial work his brand imagery, and celebrity portraiture. His provocative images were always considered controversial, but he outdid himself for Calvin Klein jeans. Everyone wanted to work with him. So I felt very fortunate to get that job, the Calvin Klein campaign with, with Bruce. And he always wore a bandana and looked kind of like a groovy Santa Claus. And uh, he was super nice. It was quite amazing just in terms of artistry as Bruce was able to find these moments within this 
to capture these snippets that weren't front and center. I would watch him completely off of what I was doing. And he would find this amazing moment with two people over here doing something or two people over here, three people over here having a conversation or taking a break to have that eye on sort of a sense of bringing in this whole picture was really impressive to see. And obviously we saw it in the results of that shoot. Bruce Weber has a very particular way of shooting. We all just hung out and he ran around and saw something. Oh, that looks good. And took pictures of it while we we're hanging out, you know, and, and then at some point said, okay, Marcus, okay, we're going to do some shots just with you in the shower. And it's going to be pretty much naked, but you can cover yourself with a pair of jeans. And are you fine with that? I said, yeah, totally. He was so nice, so respectful and, and nice. And it was a little bit scary though. In the shower, he had so many flashes and and electrical cords all over the place. I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't get electrocuted here with the, in the shower, the water coming down on me and all these lights. And But that was where this famous Canon Klein in the shower shot advertising uh, came from. And I had no idea, nobody knew. I mean, I guess Canon Klein knew, Bruce Weber knew, but my agent or me, or nobody knew until the day it came out, 116 pages as a, extra booklet in Vanity Fair. The day it came out, I looked and I was like, wow. I'm like on 80 pages of these 160 pages. When that copy of Vanity Fair hit the shelves in 1991, it caused a sensation. Overnight, Marcus was the poster boy of every female fantasy. He's cute. He's very attractive. He has a great body. I mean, how can you not love seeing Marcus Schenkberg in the shower? He's a beautiful human being, one of the kindest souls. I mean, honestly, and Lord knows I've done enough of my own pictures nude in the shower. So no judgment, but just a noticing that there was a shift in that moment of what the male model was going to become. And the male model was not just necessarily going to be eye candy and on the arm of a supermodel, but the male supermodel was dawning and there was a whole new presentation of men in the industry, especially the sort of upper echelon of these men. Marcus Schenkenberg's body was just, I mean, besides he's so great looking, the body was out of control, <laughs> beautiful. So it was, you know, the height of him, the distance between like from, the knee to the ankle is so great. You know, there's such an expanse so that you get to really see how the length and the beauty and the line of their bodies. I mean, he, he's incredible looking and the body is incredible. I mean, what can you say? There's a beautiful, beautiful, genetically blessed child. There was definitely something smoldering and under the surface and unspoken with him. And, and he showcased that beautifully in his work and in the pictures that were portrayed of him. And I believe this, this led to an intrigue and a curiosity that people viewing these pictures um, wanted to know more, wanted to see more, similar to the supermodels that were, you know, in that time, wanted to know more of the story. And because that was the style of the modeling or the, the collaborations at that time, it really led to, who are you? What more can I know about you? And, and a real big public intrigue. For Marcus, this was a life altering moment. The definitive moment when he was catapulted into the public eye and fashion was experiencing a new era. His image became representative of the male supermodel moment and continues to fascinate 30 years on. Before I started modeling, nobody even cared about male models. They were props to the women. They were in the background or, or like an accessory to the women. But I think uh, I was part of that change. They were interested in in me and they started doing interviews with me and asking me questions which had didn't really exist before then like before who advertised underwear you know i mean there were underwear with baggy awful underwear you know you weren't proud of your underwear you just put them on and all of a sudden people were in their calvins or in whoever and you had billboards and and ads all over the place of these you know kind of well-built guys in their underwear and all of a sudden the, the male physique and the male supermodel or celebrity 
who was actually um, maybe wearing Calvins for the advertising at that point. All of a sudden there was interest, but I think it was part of what sparked right. the original you know, interest. There was this feeling of emancipation. There was something where you saw men that were not afraid to embrace their sexuality or their physique and were not confined to a suit and tie any longer. They became as exciting on the runway as the women did. The shows became a celebration of who they were. And Marcus is the perfect example of that. I mean, let's be very honest. We first saw that Bruce Weber spread of Calvin Klein and it was like, okay, who is this? Marcus embodied like a complete Adonis. Marcus's physicality is as perfection as we get with the male species. He's a beautiful specimen and like a beautiful human being. Really, really stand up and really kind and really present. And what I think was really special about him and what made him stand out is both like his physicality, but also that there was a story and an energy within him that we didn't quite know. Like there was something else going on with Marcus and we were never gonna know it. There was no invitation to know what it was. There was just this like person that was portrayed where you wanted to understand and know more of him and he wasn't gonna ever say anything. And so there was a mystique the Calvin Klein campaign was my big break, and it's been synonymous almost with my entire modeling career. And I'm forever grateful to both Calvin Klein and Bruce Weber for, you know, making that happen. It was an art piece, something I was incredibly proud of just to be part of. For me, Marcus Schenkenberg was definitely the first male supermodel. Like, he broke the mold and was able for all the other guys to kind of become noticed. I just thought he was just so iconic. With that campaign coming out, it just changed everything, you know? And I met this girl, Maureen Gallagher, who I did a fashion show with in Barcelona. Mulatto girl, half black, half white. And I said, oh my gosh, what a beautiful girl. And, uh, you know, we started talking and she lived in New York and um, I lived in Paris. When I got the Cam and Klein campaign shooting in San Francisco for a week, my flight going back to Paris was through New York. So I just got off the plane in New York and then get on my connecting flight back to Paris. And I just went to her place. That's how I moved to New York. Straight from the Calvin Klein shoot. I had long hair at the moment. So most agencies said, no, sorry, we don't want to take you. Or you think your hair is too long. You have to cut it uh, if you want to be with us. And then I came to Boss Models and Jason Kanner, and they said, yeah, wow, you're great. I didn't even tell them that I'd just done the Cameron Klein campaign because I didn't even know if anything would come out of it. And then when it came out and they were like, wow, they felt like they had won the lottery, you know? And I, uh, me too. Well, after the Cameron Klein campaign uh, came out, you know, I ended up on the cover of Daily News. And my agent, Jason Kanner, actually called me and said, hey, did you see on the cover of Daily News? It's not crazy. And I'm like, what? Sure enough, there I was. From that breakout moment in 1991, things moved fast for Marcus, and his fashion career went stellar. He modeled for the likes of Jean Paul Gaultier, Versace, Armani, and L'Oreal. He broke records and the glass ceiling for his sex as the first male model to adorn the cover of Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, and French Elle. Within a year of his discovery, he was on People magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People in the World list and featured in campaigns and on runways with the top supermodels hanging off his arm. He went on to be listed as British Vogue's top 10 most successful male models of all time. In short, Marcus Schenkenberg became a household celebrity. His meteoric rise to the top had one other unique side effect. Much like his female supermodel counterparts, his star never faded. It was just 
direct bookings all over the world and people started paying attention to me. They actually interviewed me and put me on the cover of magazines and Swedish uh, and other magazines and newspapers made posters out of uh, of my pictures. Um, you know, so many people tell me they had posters of me in their bedroom and uh, uh, growing up and I was just like, this is weird, you know, but uh, I don't know. It was just perfect timing and in the supermodel era. And I was very fortunate, but also worked very hard. I mean, figured these clients and they paid so much money to book me. So I, I always did my best. I, even though if I was jet lag and tired and hadn't slept, I always gave my all and, you know, wanted to do a good job and never missed a job never missed the plane i just had good um, drive and work ethic and uh, figured how how fortunate and lucky i am to be in the position and just made the best out of it and uh, it all paid off give it up for marcus schenkenberg Marcus broke the barriers. Marcus put the male model on the map. Well, if there is such a thing as male supermodel, I guess I am. Inspired by Italian neorealism and the French New Wave, American photographer Stephanie Frenda Stylander chose an ingenue for the 1992 Harper's Bazaar Uomo shoot. 18-year-old Kate Moss presented as unknown, unusual, special and more like an actress. Alongside Marcus Schenkenberg, a male superstar who always shot in a godlike way, Stylander chose to deconstruct his look to create a cinematic love story of a cool young couple wandering the gritty streets of New York City. I shot for Harper's Bazaar with Kate Moss in New York City. Kate Moss was just kind of in the beginning of her. She wasn't super famous yet. We were all over the subway in New York City and I remember wearing these weird glasses and Kate was kind of a little bit shy and quiet, you know, but we were just running around New York City in the subway and whatnot and the photographer was clicking away and uh, it was, uh, you know, nice, easy, good shoot. I think uh, good pictures, very casual. Uh, we were just kind of doing our thing, and me and Kate and photographer just uh, snapped away. The shoot with Naomi Campbell and Kate Moss, north of Sweden at the Ice Hotel. That was. Uh, Quite an experience, you know, being in my home country up in the far north in the wintertime, shooting at the ice hotel with Herberts. He was really, really one of the photographers I always wanted to work with. So it was excited to work with him, excited to work with Naomi and Kate. But it was cold, it was so cold in the middle of the winter. It must have been, I don't know, minus 20 degrees Celsius. And I was only in a bathing suit in a Speedo sitting on an ice chair. Naomi wasn't happy about it. We, I remember we kept drinking coffees with liquor inside to keep us up warm. And we had this uh, plastic bubbles with uh, heaters inside that. While he was changing the film, we ran into these bubbles and trying to heat up and threw jackets on. And, but it was great working in my home country with uh, Naomi and Kate Moss and with her Brits which I really thought was one of the best fashion photographers ever. You just looked at Marcus and uh, his proportions were amazing. They were just right. He wasn't overly pumped and he wasn't like one of those super skinny guys that just fit into 
designer clothes, but yet that's it. It was almost like a ballet dancer, his body. It was, it, the proportions were magnificent. His long legs and um, a broad shoulder and a, a smaller waist. And um, he had his long hair, which was kind of, you know, interesting. And he's just great looking. And then you met him and he was absolutely wonderful and totally into working and the photo shoot and getting it right. And one of the fame, more well-known photos, I say, that we, we did um, of Marcus is a photo that we did of Marcus uh, with Linda and uh, with Jesse the Chimp, uh, actually. And it was for a, a company we were working for at that point by the name of Kenar. Linda was the contract model for uh, Kenar at that time. And we did some really great photos of her. Who better to be um, Tarzan than uh, I mean, no, Marcus. There was it was no like, one else. come on, seriously? This is like a no brainer. You know, it was, he was perfect for it. And we um, did the shot and um, it was a hysterical day because Jesse, the chimp was- It's a female. Was a female, uh, but was absolutely unbelievable and had the whole set. Um, hysterical laughing. We had a very hard time just kind of keeping it together. The Ken R shoot with Linda Evangelista and the little cute monkey. We had the Tarzan and Jane theme, <clears throat> like we were in a movie set, a little monkey between us. It was amazingly human, like this monkey, and so cute. And uh, it was a great shoot. Rocco had been, as a, he was so nice, such a great photographer. Linda was nice and a good mood. And that picture turned out so nice. With Jesse the Chimp, who took an unbelievable love of Marcus. I mean, to the point where, um, you know, it would be, we'll give Marcus a kiss, you know, for one of the photos. And as Jesse would do it, Jesse's toes would curl up every time she kissed Marcus. I mean, literally, we're like, okay, this is really getting a little strange because when she kisses Marcus, her toes curl. There were absolutely no fashion billboards in Times Square. And when we suggested it, Kenar really was the first company to actually brave the waters. It ended up as a billboard at Times Square, huge poster in the middle of Times Square. And it was up there for almost a year, I think. Uh, I lived around that area. So every time I went downtown, uh, to a restaurant or a club or friends or whatever. I drove by this uh, huge poster of myself at Times Square. The uh, Stephen Klein shoot. Yeah, it was, um, it was uh, I think, in Long Island, New York. Came out there and he didn't really have a, quite a plan on what to do. They were talking about dyeing my hair, which they asked if they could do. And I said, yeah, sure. And so they did that. They dyed my hair and, uh, and we had... Yeah, some uh, wild and crazy outfits. I mean, that was kind of uh, homoerotic, uh, I would say. Like, I remember my mom saw those pictures and she, that's actually the first time she said she didn't really like, like the pictures and I can see why. When Alexander McQueen presented his own take of classical Greece for his 1997 Givenchy debut, the scene that unfolded was mythic. Constructed at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, an A-list of supermodels floated regally across the runway in stunning gowns. But way up high was perched a surprise addition, an angel. Marcus Schenkenberg transformed into Icarus, semi-naked, complete with wax chest, looked nonchalantly over the scene from his heavenly vantage point. Far from presenting as camp, McQueen's aesthetic was characterized by a certain darkness that captured the imagination. It was a genius pairing, not only offering an arresting editorial moment, but capturing for posterity some of the supermodel's most memorable and loved images that perfectly visualized the spiritual effect of Schenkenberg's flawlessness. It was a transcendental moment that ironically, Schenkenberg was unaware of at the time. I was um, in Paris and they wanted me as uh, for the fashion show and I was kind of confused at first because I knew it was all women haute couture clothing and I was wondering what what am I going to wear you know and uh, I got to the uh, show and uh, and they had built this huge, two ginormous uh, wings, like angel wings, like kind of like Victoria's Secret, but 
but much, much bigger. So I was sitting on top of the, above the stage where the show was with these huge angel wings and pretty much that was my job, you know, <laughs> sitting there during the show and uh, I guess uh, guarding these uh, models being their guardian angel or something, 30, 40 feet high up in there and watching the show. I didn't even realize when I was sitting there how how nice it looked. Not until afterwards when I saw photos of it, I thought, wow, that looks pretty cool, you know, better than I thought, you know. I was, uh, to be honest, kind of a little bit bummed. I, I, you know, when I found out I was going to sit up there and not be part of the show. But looking back afterwards, I think um, it, it looked really nice. As a designer, I have always found that he brings out the true and utmost potential of the clothes he wears. He knows his body, how to move it, and how to use his energy to give life to pictures. Some almost explode off the page. Others have the sense of a frozen moment in time. All of them are powerful and expressive. That's one reason why he became the first male model people recognized by name, Gianni Versace. My two favorite jobs of all time is uh, uh, the Cam and Clank campaign, which I did with Bruce Weber, Carrie Otis and, and the gang, and which gave me my, my big break. And then the um, Versace campaign with uh, Richard Avedon, which I think Richard Avedon is really probably the number one photographer I ever worked with. It was amazing. I mean, he, he was 75 years old, so much energy, like incredible. And I was shooting for, what was it, six days? in his studio in New York uh, with Stephanie Seymour, who, who I kind of had a crush on. So it was uh, uh, very exciting to go to work every day, even though I was completely naked in those pictures. And so that was kind of awkward, you know, she was wearing all the clothing and the dresses and I was completely naked, which was the first day or two was kind of awkward. So we were working for uh, seven days in, in New York in his studio after two, three days, Figure out okay, everyone's pretty many much see me naked. So you almost started eating lunch naked, like, you know, not quite, but uh, but uh, after it was no big deal. The photos from Richard Avedon from Versace, they're just so artistic, and you know, I love the black and white, and you know, I don't know, he's really he was really a genius uh, Richard Avedon I think and even though it was a very hard shoot like one picture I had this big Versace cover that I'm I had to jump holding the cover behind me and I must have done it a hundred or two hundred times you know to get exactly that perfect picture that he wanted and uh, so it was quite hard you know to do or on jumping on the concrete floor uh, so many times butt naked you know but in the end, you know, he got such amazing pictures out of it. So I was just happy and uh, felt so lucky to work with him. Avedon's campaign for Versace with Marcus and Stephanie is, you know, it's iconic. It is taking the best of what Richard Avedon does, which is giant heroic portraits shot on 8 by 10 film. And um, it just puts it in your face. And those are the days when everything was print film. So the the lushness even on magazine stock paper really gave us a chance to look at something which was bordering between commercial art and fine art. And I think it was incredibly inventive and it was a great, it was a new way to see product. Like the robe would be kind of open and falling off. Or I remember that amazing picture of Stephanie and Marcus showing off tableware, really austere dynamic pictures. Very, very different from anything else we had seen. Close.
American style is very easy, breezy, t-shirt and jeans uh, kind of thing. Uh, when I'm home and normally in my shorts or sweats or t-shirts or naked or like, you know, I don't, I'm not really a fashion uh, guru of any type. Uh, I never really been interested in fashion. It's It's been a just a job. I mean, I show up in the studio, they tell me, what to wear and I put it on and I do some photos, but I never been really interested in fashion, to be honest. I don't have anything in my wardrobe that's like, if anything, maybe my old uh, Versace uh, suits that I got from Johnny Versace himself uh, that are almost collecting pieces right now, you know. As far as fashion, I don't really, you know, I'm not into it. Like I have some suits for when I have to wear suits and but normally, I just dress comfortably. Marcus Schenkenberg is that rare creature that presents as an image maker's dream. Even before his modeling career, he had that je ne sais quoi that turned heads and moved onlookers to rapture. The Schenkenberg effect has served him well, giving him celebrity sex symbol status and allowing a career that has kept on to the present day. I think part of the longevity, uh, like that I've been able to work for so long in the business is because, uh, you know, I think naturally I've always, you know, I take care of myself. Working out is uh, on a regular basis, something I would have done even if, uh, if I wasn't a mom, you know, because it makes me feel good, makes me feel strong, more self-confident. And so that's definitely something I would have done uh, either way. I always love to travel. So that was a good thing too. And uh, so it fitted me in every way. Everything about modeling suited me well, you know, except for being super jet lag uh, at, uh, many times, you know, but, but that was a small price to pay for all the pros and, and of, of being a model. You know, it, it really, it really fitted me. Ever since Schenkenberg's popularity went beyond fashion to front page news, He's been the subject of celebrity spotting in tabloid newspapers. With a reputation for being a party animal, there's been plenty to write home about through the 90s and noughties. His high-profile romances read like a Hollywood A-list. Nikki Hilton, Jessica Simpson, Baywatch babes Pamela Anderson and Angelica Bridges, Patricia Velasquez, Grace Jones, Mariah Carey, Madonna, there's even rumours of a princess. It was so crazy, you know, for me going, like I said, in, in school, I was not the most popular guy. I didn't get invited to the coolest parties. And all of a sudden, women were going bananas for me. And I was, uh, I was loving it, you know, like getting all that attention and they all were interested in me and want to be with me. I'm like, hey, this is, this is a nice. Maureen was my first real, Maureen Gallagher from New York. We, we did fashion shows in Spain together. It was kind of love at first sight as well. We did a show together and um, I thought she was so beautiful. And uh, I guess she liked me too. And we was a fast hook up too. I think all my girlfriends, we kind of, as soon as we saw each other, we pretty much ended up in bed together that night. Rosemary Wetzel, Grace Jones, Princess Stephanie of Monaco. Well, I think the most famous girlfriend is uh, Pamela Anderson, who I met in uh, Monte Carlo. We were there for the uh, World Music Awards. Dan Matthews from PETA was there too, so we had a kind of a common person we knew. We had the show and then dinner and then partying. And, and that night, um, Pamela had the room right under me, actually, uh, a suite right under me. And we went uh, after the club. We went back there and had our own little party and kind of uh, clicked right away. And. Uh, I remember then we stayed an extra day there and hung out. And then after that, I had to go back to New York because I, I was in acting school in New York. But as soon as I finished school, 
couple of weeks later. I took a plane out to uh, Los Angeles. She picked me up at the airport and uh, we went to her place and I stayed uh, basically there for a year with her, uh, lived on the beach in Malibu. It was very quick and kind of a love at first sight almost kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, it was a great relationship. I mean, she uh, has a reputation of being a little wild and crazy, but really, she was such a great mom, taking good care of her kids. We were kind of partying a lot too, and uh, you know, and she also had a show VIP. I went with her on, on set, and basically we were inseparable. We spent all the time we could together. It was uh, a little bit different though. I mean, she was so famous, and. You know, having paparazzi hiding in the bushes and she had a stalker that dropped off presents. Uh, it was just a lot of attention. When it comes to talking about his current status, the answer is much more coy. The truth is, Marcus Schenkenberg is something of a romantic. Will there be a Mrs. Marcus Schenkenberg in the near future? Me. Yeah, well... <laughs> I am, I guess I am a bit of romantic, you know. When I was younger, you know, I figured it was the most important thing in my life to reproduce, have children. But also during my career, I've had like maybe five serious girlfriends in my life. I could have had children with any of these women, but I was always on the road traveling, you know, going from there to there and there. I could go away for months and I wanted to be a hands-on father. I wanted to really raise my kids you know so now that i'm older and i mean i don't work as crazy uh, all the time flying around so now it's the perfect time but i just have to find the right partner and and, and uh, if that happens i'm i'm ready to go a toast the most brilliant chemist on the planet and his greatest invention yet marcus schenkenberg marcus schenkenberg Becoming a household name certainly has its perks. Marcus Schenkenberg was not only a pin-up boy for magazines, calendars, TV and tabloid news, but a multi-dimensional brand in his own right that offered other men a touch of the unattainable Schenkenberg effect. His long association with underwear has seen Marcus launch a successful line of his own branded undergarments. He also has colognes, a men's jewelry line, body wear, and other accessories. I thought about the design a lot, the writing, and everyone seems to love the product. Pearls from Tahiti mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. everybody, mm -hmm. not, not so expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a bit rock and roll too. I've done the, my fragrance line, the, um, my cologne and my underwear, bodywear line with shirts and underwear. And, uh, and I also have a jewelry line with pearls for men, which is quite unusual. But I did that with Gellner, a Swiss company that uh, specializes in, in pearls. So I think it might be the first male jewelry line with pearls for men. It's quite successful and still selling to this day. You know, like my uh, cologne, it's, it's the smell, you know, it's just a smell that everyone likes. I never heard anyone say they don't like it. As far as my underwear, they're really comfortable, made out of really soft material and holds everything in place, so to say. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, everyone just, like the product so these are products that i really believed in and liked you know and it was uh, so it was uh, the real thing you know things that i still wear and use to this day what has kept marcus schenkenberg at the top of the pyramid is his physical grandeur Genetics definitely plays a part in Schenkenberg's perfect proportions. The rest is old-fashioned hard work. From the day Schenkenberg started a weights routine at the age of 16, he's maintained an intense strength training program that includes bodybuilding and cardiovascular, such as aerobics, running, and basketball, keeping his heart rate up with short rests. It's allowed him to compete with the best, whether in boxing, horse riding, car racing, bob sledding naked for charity, or any other physical challenge he's taken on in the line of duty. Schenkenberg's authority on the subject of workouts even inspired his very own fitness video. Perhaps unsurprisingly, 
given the eye candy for women. Francois Nas. Marcus's face is like a sketchbook. He can be natural or go all the way with makeup. He's artistic in his approach to modeling because he can feel what the picture is about and play that up for the camera. Because of this, and because he is open and accepting of change, he is definitely a man who can wear makeup and still be himself. Schenkenberg has worked his opportunities in other important ways and is often credited for bringing activism and social consciousness early to the fashion industry. A passionate animal activist and advocate, he backs charities across the globe. All the proceeds from his autobiography went to the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. He's a patron of the LR Global Kids Fund in Sweden, as well as a spokesperson for the animal rights group, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA. Probably the most memorable campaign was bearing all in Times Square, alongside other boss models in the fight to ban fur. I've done all kinds of charity, everything from cancer to MS to, I mean, everything. Um, but PETA is probably the one I've been working the most for. I think they contacted me through my agency, Boss Models, back in the day, and they asked us to do a uh, campaign for against fur, turn your back on fur. So I think it was the first job I did for them. Uh, we were at Times Square, a bunch of us, maybe eight models and we were turning our back on fur naked at Times Square. We were not actually 100% naked. We had some little things covering our, our most private parts since I think it would have been, we could have been arrested if we were completely naked. So, uh, but that was the first time I worked with them, I think. And Dan Matthews from PETA became kind of a friend of mine and we, we did so many different things together in Milan and LA and all over the world. Uh, I did a campaign for them, let the birds free and something about nightclubs in New York where they had, uh, you couldn't get into a club if you were wearing fur. And uh, so we did so much work. And like I said, Dan Matthews from PETA became kind of a friend. And yeah, I was very, very happy to work with him. You know, gem, animals in general, they have no voice and they're so innocent and they can't speak up for themselves. So I figured if I could help them speak up, I would certainly be happy to do that. And also fur, I mean, killing an animal or several animals just to, for a coat, it's just horrible. I was always against that. And um, like I said, I always loved animals. So it was certainly a great pleasure to work with PETA. I've been involved for a long time. Since Baywatch days, I was calling him. I've been an animal activist since I was little, you know, rolling nickels and quarters and sending him off to animal causes. I think it's a very important message to get across the world. And I think because we are public figures, instead of people using it for bad, for press and for tabloids, it's good to be put, if you do have a name that's known to the public, I think it's good to use it for important things like this. Modeling has certainly offered Schenkenberg an incredible career. While expanding into multifaceted business, once I became well known for modeling, I got so many offers, you know, from doing movies, from singing and all kinds of different things. So I tried, you know, for example, I had a friend who's a producer who made a song, La Chica Marita. He asked me to come to the studio and just, you know, try some singing for fun. And next thing I knew, Virgin Records wanted to sign me on. And so I went to Germany, did PR and did some festival in front of 15,000 people where they had different artists doing one or two songs and you know I tried my thing in that. Of recent years Schenkenberg has moved back to his roots in Stockholm, Sweden after over 20 years living in New York City. This is partially to be closer to family, partially because of the evolving political situation in the USA and partly due to his continued popularity in the European film and TV world. These days, he spends more time focusing on his original love, acting. 
I got acting offers for movies and I did my first film, Hostage, playing a lead role without any acting training or anything. It went okay, but that's where I got my interest in acting and uh, took acting lessons in New York for two years at William Esper Studios and, uh, and did some more of that. That's something I actually enjoyed. He has acted a lot, more than people might think. Uh, he's always taken acting classes and he did a great indie movie in the 90s where he played an art director. Really good, non-glamorous role. He was the bad guy in Prince Valiant, also in the 90s, with rotten teeth. And he was really the villain in that one, so going, going against type. So I think he will act a lot in the future. He did test for a lot of things, though. He tested for Robin and for Batman. and But all those Hollywood guys are very short, so I think they're intimidated by you know, he's very tall, but I think he would do a lot of acting in the future. These days, Marcus is philosophical about his career and what it all means. What's next for Marcus Sinkenberg? Well, I, uh, I'll just continue. To